I'm nervous to touch the space bar. <laughs> Don't do it. You must. You must. We got a call out of the blue um, from my best friend yesterday. I was sitting in my kitchen and, and uh, I told him that I was uh, going to be doing this talk. And I said I had about 10 minutes and, and uh, my friend, his name's Craig, he laughed out loud. I said, why are you laughing? He said, Jerry, you couldn't talk about anything in 10 minutes. I said, I can talk about lots of things in 10 minutes. I, I can talk about lots of things. And he said, well, that's not the problem. If, if I ask you what you're having for breakfast, it'll take you 11 minutes to talk about <laughs> what you're having for breakfast. And uh, I, I guess his point was I just about pushed the thing off the stage. That wasn't his point. Uh, his point was that sometimes I have trouble staying succinct, which I guess is proven by the fact that I've spent the first of my 10 minutes talking about how I can't talk about something in 10 minutes. In February, the New York Times released 28 years of data. Um, they gave us the keys to it, and I spent um, a, about a month working with that data and came up with some, I think, some pretty interesting things. Uh, I started with bar graphs. I'm not going to talk much about these graphs because they're all on the interweb. Um, but this is a graph showing uh, the increase in the word um, internet, <laughs> uh, as opposed to the word web. Web is in blue, internet is in red. Um, this is a graph with, uh, with communism, or with communism at the bottom and terrorism at the top. Uh, it starts in 1980 and it ends in 2009, so you can see that um, communism was the big monster, of course, and then as of 9-11, um, it sort of stopped being a big monster. This is a graph showing the occurrence of the word Iran versus the word Iraq. Iran in red, Iraq in black. This is a timepiece graph. It reads like a clock, so if you start at the beginning of the clock and you go all the way around, we start at 1981 and we end up at 2009. And what you see is uh, the Iran-Contra affair at about 2.30, you see the first Gulf War down here at about 4 o'clock, and then we can see Iraq kind of taking up the, um, the uh, spectrum since then. This graph was actually rendered in February, and if I re-render this graph, we would see Iran starting to come up again. And that's why I put it in a circle, because I wanted to suggest this idea that news is cyclical and we're going to see the same things over and over and over again. Similarly, this is another radio graph showing us um, hope in, in white and crisis in black it's from 1981 until 2009. Um, what we see is that there are actually only three times when um, crisis has overcome hope. Um, and we're in one of them right now at the top. <laughs> Happy stuff, hey? Eh? <laughs> I, I went as far as to try to think about how I can take an entire year's worth of news and cram it into one graphic. And what you see here is all of the news stories, or all the important news stories, um, in 1984. So we see the important people and organizations in the center, and then the less important people and organizations on, on the outside. And the lines that you see are, are showing how they're connected in the stories that the New York Times published. So this is a very complicated graph, and maybe doesn't succeed as a, as a communication design piece, but certainly succeeds in reminding us how fucked up the world is. <laughs> um, nothing, it's not all serious. This is the, uh, the Mets and the Yankees starting in, in uh, 1981, and again going all the way around. So we see the Subway Series as these spikes where um, both of the teams are included, but you can kind of see this, this um, lobbying back and forth between the two teams. One of the things that I really learned with the Times is that in, in the heart of it, it's a local paper. So we get lots of stories about New York that sometimes overshadow the bigger events. Um, this is all really useful stuff, so let's stop it. And let's talk about something a little bit stranger. While I was working with the Times API, they introduced something called the Newswire. And the Newswire gives you everything that the Times publishes a second before it hits the website or a second before it hits the newspapers. And immediately I thought to myself, this is awesome. And then I thought, why on earth would I need to know the news before it hit the web? And I realized that I was being caught in this trap that the media want us to believe, which is that news is really important and critical. But the fact is, when you read a newspaper and you were to cut it up into little pieces and put one pile, stuff that's important and critical, and the other pile, stuff that isn't really important at all, you would end up with one, one, one very, very, very small pile and one very, very big pile. 
But the newswire um, works really simply. Uh, I don't want to bore you with too much technical stuff, so I'll skim through this pretty quickly. We have um, something called an API on the New York Times side, which is like a doorway into their database. And what I did is I built a client which um, talks to that API, and then it sends the information that it's received to a device which I call the news alarm. Um, and I, I thought maybe this alarmist sense that we get centering around media could be exposed by making a device. Um, the news alarm takes a list of stories that come in through the news wire, and it runs them through a filter. And it, the filter it hits enough. Um, I will talk about the filter later, but if it if it if it gets set off, then it fires a signal to the news alarm. Well, what does the news alarm look like? That's the news alarm in the background. And it's an 85 decibel smoke alarm. And, and I thought, well, okay, if the news is that important, then I want to hear it. <laughs> and, and so I built this device, which is a really, uh, um, I, and I, I, I have a high-tech dampening system. Uh, is with the news alarm so that I don't deafen myself. <laughs> uh, the news alarm is built using a piece of technology called an Arduino. Has anybody heard of an Arduino before? An Arduino is a little piece of, of hardware made in Italy, and it's made by a, a, a group of people who are trying to bring back this idea that we can make shit in our basements. So they've built these things called Arduinos, which allow you to make things in your basement that can do um, really fantastic tasks. So, uh, this is dramatic. Oh. <laughs> uh, That's my test subject. This is my dog, Trapper. Uh, he wasn't very close to the 85 decibel news alarm, in case you're wondering. Uh, I, I got a call from the CDC one day. They wanted to talk to me about the news alarm, and, 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 and they asked me a question. They said, why would you possibly, well, can you think of anything that you could possibly use this for? Is this practical? And, and I thought, no, of course it's not practical. And then I thought, wait, there is one thing. Um, we live in, in, on the West Coast, and we're about three hours behind the East Coast. So I thought, what happened in the morning? Uh, oh, sorry, I just put my quotes in my seat. I'm going to go back to that. Uh, if aliens arrive, okay? So aliens arrive, where are aliens going to land uh, if they arrive? New York. New York City, right? <laughs> so I thought, shit, what if aliens land in the morning? <laughs> and I'm sleeping, and you wake up. And have you read this happen where you wake up and some jerk comes to you and says, oh, did you see the news? Well, I want to be that jerk if, if aliens are not, right? So um, I set up the news alarm to, to say if more than 50% of the, of the stories coming in through the New York Times feed have the word aliens in the title, then an 85 decibel smoke alarm is going to wake me up. Yeah, you're laughing now. Thank you, that's all I have. I don't know. <laughs>